by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Yorak Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from the United States of America, from the Inquisition Update Ministry, who you very well know, we are gathered here together to do the 69th uh, reading, study, actually, uh, which is reading and discussing the book Exploding the Israel Deception, or... Uh, we started with the book, let's call it this way, we started with the book End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg, then we got into the final chapter, the final chapter is a book on itself, and that is called Exploding the Israel Deception, and there we have done a few parts already, and we are going today into the next part of uh, reading this by studying Matthew Henry, who was a commentator on the King James Bible, and who commented on uh, the, old, the Old Testament, or the Law and the Prophets, as we should call it better, instead of Old Testament. Old Testament is something like, oh, it's done away with, we don't need that. And the history of the Law and the Prophets is absolutely important for understanding the new covenant that Jesus Christ made with all of us. And that's what it's all about. Jesus Christ made a new covenant uh, with many for one week. And so in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, Matthew Henry commented, and this is the next part where we read this, and this is part of the Exploding the Israel Deception study. Yeah, It's not a reading, it's a study. And therefore I warmly welcome Brother Tom, who is already very anxious to tell you what it actually <laughs> is all about in a little bit better English <laughs> than me. <laughs> Hello Tom, welcome. Oh, I'll tell you what, for a German, you have excellent English and... Uh... You, you probably speak better English than I do. And, and anyway, in lieu of your uh, accent, your English is very proper and it's good. Listen, uh, we're in this, this little sidebar uh, to discuss uh, Matthew Henry's 
commentaries. And the purpose of this, uh, the listeners may have already discovered, the purpose of reading Matthew Henry's commentaries is to show, to prove what people believed, what Bible-believing Christians believed about Daniel's 70 weeks, Daniel's 70-week prophecy, what they believed about it, how how they believed it was fulfilled in history uh, prior to the the uh, the uh, poisoning of the spiritual water by futurism. Okay, prior to 1805 or 1810, somewhere in that area. Bible-believing Christians were historicists. They saw the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago. It was Christ's ministry. Seven-year period of time from his baptism, three and a half years later to his crucifixion, three and a half years later to the stoning of Stephen and the going forth of the uh, gospel to the Gentiles. That was the 70th week of Daniel. It was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. That's called historicism, okay? Futurism deals with the same biblical prophecy, Daniel's 70th week, Daniel's 70 weeks, but they say it isn't fulfilled yet and won't be fulfilled until just three and a half or seven years before Christ's literal return, and it won't be Jesus or Messiah that will fulfill it, but the Antichrist. Now, you can't get more deceived than that. And that's what is taught, and that's what is believed in all the churches today. Not just in America, but all around the world. Christianity is apostate. Christianity doesn't even legitimately deserve the title Christianity because if they're futurist in their belief and not historicist in their belief, they literally deny that Jesus was the Christ. If the 70th week of Daniel was the ministry of Messiah 2,000 years ago, And it was, it is, the 70th week of Daniel was that seven-year period of time when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem, fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, especially Daniel's 70th week prophecy. To say that that's all yet future is to deny that Jesus came in the flesh, is to deny that Jesus was the Messiah. Simple logic. You can't call yourself a Christian, that is, one who believes in Messiah, the Prince, and then say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. You can't be a futurist and a Christian at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. Because to call yourself a Christian means you believe that Jesus was the Christ. To call yourself a futurist, or to believe in futurism, suggests that Christ has not yet come. So how can you be a Christian and be a futurist? And in the meantime, Tom, you go on, make sacrifices. That's right. In the form of the Mass in the Roman Catholic Church. That's right. And even now in the Protestant evangelical churches, they're beginning to embrace the idea that the communion bread and the the communion wine is now the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to be sacrificed again on the altar. They're beginning to call the bread and the wine of the communion table, which by Christ's own mouth is a memorial of his death. And we are to remember his death until we come, because till he comes, because it is through his death, the shedding of his blood, that our sins are washed away. 
And we are to remember what he did to earn our salvation. He died and his blood washes away our sins. Okay? It's to remember the sacrifice, the one time all sufficient sacrifice that Jesus made. Okay? And now, with futurism and ecumenism, they are now free to teach that the communion bread and the wine is literally transforming gradually into another sacrifice. That Jesus must be perpetually sacrificed. And if you offer any other sacrifice than the one that Jesus made 2,000 years ago, you nullified what Jesus did. And his blood has no effect to wash away your sins. Look, if your sins be washed away in the blood of Christ, what need do you have of a sacrifice? Do you see that making another sacrifice literally repudiates the one that Jesus made for you? You have to have a do-over. And I want the listeners to comprehend that has always been the central religious uh, decoration in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist, the sacrifice called the Mass. It, it's the, the very thing that defines the Roman Catholic Church. It is the church of sacrifice. And they sacrifice every time they get together. They have the Mass and they make sacrifices. And just as the futurist Christians who have lost all understanding are now, are now financing and supporting in prayer and every other way the return of the Jews to Jerusalem, the building of a, of a future temple wherein the Jews might make animal sacrifices again. The Christ-rejecting Jews sewing back up the veil of the temple and continuing animal sacrifices, thus eating and drinking damnation to themselves and repudiating the one-time all-sufficient sacrifice for sin, the blood of Christ. The whole world is in apostasy. And what is leading that apostasy is the Roman Catholic Church, the doctrine and traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. The whole world is drunk with the wine. That is the false doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, illegal relations with the whore of Rome, and they too are drunk to delirium with the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And you see, so there's already been a great deal of ecumenism. There may be some little, inter, uh, little uh, disagreements here and there between them, but they're all coming to common communion with the Roman Catholic Church. Everything is going in the direction of a, of, of a common communion among all religions. The papacy is going to have, the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, is going to have the whole world eating and drinking damnation to itself. Again, the purpose of reading uh, Matthew Henry's commentary is to prove to you what Protestants believed and taught about Daniel's 70th week. And you will find, just as anyone who can read, that Matthew Henry proves that Bible-believing Christians were historicists, that Daniel's 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. Matthew Henry and his commentary proves that every futurist church, every futurist Christian in this country, and you realize that that's an oxymoron, to say a futurist Christian, there's no such thing. That Matthew Henry 
had never heard of it. He never mentioned it, as far as I know. It had never been taught in the Protestant world. Protestants kept the memorial through through the through the uh, communion bread and wine through the table of communion. They remembered the sacrifice that Jesus made. Now, if the seventieth week of Daniel is future, that's an error now to remember the seventieth week of Daniel when they teach that the seventieth week of Daniel is future. So they've got to transform the communion bread and wine into a form, an acceptable form of the Roman Catholic mass. And that's what they're doing. They're doing it right in front of your face. And I want you to be able to see it and recognize it whenever you go to a, a, a Protestant or evangelical church and they use the term to describe the bread and wine as the Eucharist, now you know why. It's conformity to a new world religion headed up by the papacy. Okay, that's a very long introduction. I'm sorry that it took so long, but we're proving what we've asserted all along. We're showing you a Protestant commentator, well known. And from there, you can do your own research. And let me tell you, most, if not all of the books that I've read on Inquisition Update over the last, what, nearly 20 years, they were all historicists in their eschatology. There wasn't a futurist among them. They'd never heard of futurism. That's because futurism is a lie. Futurism is the newest abomination on the block and it only got it only got its beginning in the protestant and evangelical seminaries in the early 1800s okay you're back to our reading and discussion of matthew henry's commentary so the yeah. listeners can see for themselves we tell the truth thank you tom back to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I just have to correct you there. There is at least one book that you were reading that is absolutely futurist to the core. And that, of course, was one of the best readings you ever did. The Global Vatican yeah. by Francis yeah. Rooney. <laughs> I wouldn't call him an historicist. Um, so oh, that's one. <laughs> Dave Hunt's book, too, was a futurist book. Yeah, 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 but. You know, the, yeah, of course, but it's the same with uh, it's the same with uh, Francis Rooney. The way you read it uh, yep. made it historicist, uh, sure. and that's the wonderful thing about it. Now, uh, I'm 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 just um, uh, going pregnant with thought here, Tom. Uh, mm -hmm. While you did your explaining, I thought uh, I posed the question out here in the open to you right now. If the study, uh, when we finish the study and not only Matthew Henry, but the whole study of uh, exploding the Israel deception, uh, end time delusion, the whole story, when that's done, what do you think that we continue with an open Bible study of the book of Hebrews? Because I think the book of Hebrews is very clear about that we have one high priest who did one sacrifice once and for right. all. That's right. We'll get it directly. Like I've said, and the listeners know, if they're regular listeners, we spent two years going word for word through the New Testament. Oh, more than two years, Tom. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I lost track of time. <laughs> but, but, but we proved beyond any doubt, every tenet of Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And the New Testament is a literal historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. It's as almost as if the New Testament was written for the very purpose of showing the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. They go hand in hand. And, and every word that is used in Daniel's prophecy is used in the New Testament. And the book of Hebrews is just one great example of all the books in the New Testament proving that it was written to testify 
of the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, don't lose sight of the fact the whole discussion is to prove that futurism is an abomination straight from hell. If you believe in futurism, you must deny what is written in the New Testament. You must deny the covenant that Christ made for us in his own precious blood. You cannot be a futurist and a Bible-believing Christian. They are mutually exclusive. You can be one or the other, but you cannot be both. And I know this is going to be a frightful thing to hear to some people. But listen, that's where I was for 50 years of my life. Okay? I professed Jesus out of one side of my mouth, and I denied him out of the other. And there was nobody in the Christian world that could show me my error. That in itself is an unspeakable horror. And that's why Yerk and I are doing these programs to help the listeners shed futurism and deny it as our greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Back to you, Yerk. So, Tom, I take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, that, uh, the short answer is yes, and I can't wait to get to it. The book of Hebrews is coming right up. <laughs> okay, now for today we are going to continue in page 9 of the 24 that uh, I copied out of the ESORT uh, commentary of Matthew Henry. And we are going now into concerning the return of the Jews, yeah? because it's about they are in 70-year captivity, of course, as you all know, they are in 70 years captivity and the captivity will be done at a certain moment and then there is this prophecy um, that is spoken of in verse 24 where it says 70 weeks are determined upon your holy city and your people speaking of Daniel's people so concerning the return of the Jews now speedily to their own land and their settlement again there which was the thing that Daniel now principally prayed for and yet, it is but briefly touched upon here in the answer to his prayer. Let this be a comfort to the pious Jews, that a commandment shall go forth to restore and to build Jerusalem, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. And the commandment shall not be in vain, for though the times will be very troublous, and this good work will meet with great opposition, yet it shall be carried on and brought to perfection, at last. The street shall be built again, as spacious and, and splendid as it ever was, and the walls even in troublous times. Note, as long as we are here in this world, we must expect troublous times upon some account or other. Jesus Christ said, in this world Ye will have tribulation. Who is ye? The ones who profess Jesus before man. If you deny Jesus before man, he will deny you before the Father. But if you profess Jesus Christ here in this world, you must expect troublous times. You must expect tribulation. Not a seven-year futurist tribulation, but tribulation all through your life. Sometimes a little bit harder, sometimes a little bit weaker, but tribulation all through your life. Even when we have joyous times, we must rejoice with trembling. It is but a gleam, it is but a lucid interval of peace and prosperity. The clouds will return after the rain. When the Jews are restored and triumph to their own land, yet there they must expect troublous times and prepare for them. But this is our comfort, 
that God will carry on his own work, will build up his Jerusalem, will beautify it, will fortify it, even in troublous times. Nay, the troublous of the times may be the grace of God contribute to the advancement of the church. The more it is afflicted, the more it multiplies. Concerning the Messiah and his undertaking. The carnal Jews looked for a Messiah that could deliver them from the Roman yoke and give them temporal power and wealth, whereas they were here told that the Messiah should come upon another errand, purely spiritual, and upon the account of which he should be uh, the more welcome. First, Christ came to take away sin and to abolish that. Sin had made a quarrel between God and man. Sin had alienated men from God and provoked God against man. Sin was this that put dishonor upon God and brought misery upon mankind. This sin was the great mischief maker. He that would do God a real service and man a real kindness must be the destruction of this. Christ undertakes to be so, and for this purpose he is manifested to destroy the works of the devil. He does not say to finish your transgressions and your sins, but transgression in sin and sin in general, for he is the propitiation not only for our sins, that are Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. He came first to finish transgression, to restrain it, so some, to break the power of it, to bruise the head of that serpent. You read that in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise, uh, you shall bruise his heel, and he shall bruise your head, or crush your head. What's the exact wording? I forgot it now. He yeah. will crush your head, and you, you will bruise his heel. Yeah? That had done so much mischief, talking of the snake, talking of the devil, to take away the usurped dominion of that tyrant, speaking of the devil, and to set up a kingdom of holiness and love in the hearts of men upon the ruins of Satan's kingdom there, that, where sin and death had reigned, righteousness and life through grace might reign. you want to comment that, Tom? I would just say, listen, the Jews had it wrong. They wanted relief from Roman oppression. They wanted to govern themselves like they did before before under the kings <coughs> they wanted an everlasting kingdom but before a righteous kingdom can come to this world the issue of sin had to be dealt with okay you can't make an everlasting kingdom of righteousness with sinners okay so, so the Jews didn't understand God's agenda. Oh, there's going to be a kingdom. It's going to last forever. And it's going to be righteous. It's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what Daniel's prophecy prophesied. To put an end of sin. To make reconciliation for iniquity. That is, reconcile sinners to God. To do away with the enmity, the, 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 the controversy between man and God. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Something had to be done. And if that something is never done, then there can be no eternal kingdom of righteousness because righteousness doesn't exist. So now we know why Christ came to die to take care of the sin issue, to make every man righteous in God's eyes. Every man then becomes fit to dwell in an eternal kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the Jews, the, the, the unbelieving Jews, 
didn't understand. And uh, they were resentful that Jesus wouldn't overthrow the Roman government. And so they literally made Jesus subject to the Roman government and used the Roman government to kill him. And uh, we're living in the consequences. Uh, Rome rules over all of us. I know, I know that's an unpopular uh, assertion, but that's the way it is. We're all made slaves of the Roman pontiff. And that's a subject we discussed in a program that we did, Yerk and I just did a little while ago. And uh, the, the, the real issue is the enmity that exists between fallen man and an all holy God. And Jesus took care of that issue. Settled it once and for all. And now we just await his return. But the kingdom already exists. The Bible plainly makes it clear that the, the kingdom was added to daily as the gospel went forth among the Jews and eventually the Gentiles. After the seven-year period of time was over, after the 70th week of Daniel was over, the salvation that was meant for the Jews went to the Gentiles. And for the first time, Gentiles were added to the kingdom. And Gentiles were added daily. And uh, the kingdom's been in the building ever since. And uh, the kingdom is building in the king's absence, who has gone away to be with his father to provide for us a new heaven and a new earth, a mansion, he said. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And, uh, and he's coming again to receive us unto himself. There's your everlasting kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom where the sin issue has been dealt with. Man has been changed to conform to the image of his dear son. And the earthly kingdoms are going to be destroyed, every one of them. In a moment, all the kingdoms of the earth are going to be ground to powder and blow away with the wind. Praise his holy name. That's what we've got to look forward to. But we don't have to look forward to a future 70th week of Daniel. That is denying that Jesus is the Christ. And if Jesus be not the Christ, we are still yet in our sins. And there is no kingdom to hope for. But if the 70th week of Daniel is like Matthew Henry insists, it is historical. It happened 2,000 years ago, and Jesus was that prince, that Messiah. Then we have a kingdom. We have a king, and we have a constitution, and we have, for the first time since creation, a righteous, eternal kingdom. And uh, I only hope and pray that the Jews be added back into the, to, grafted into the vine. But you certainly aren't going to have repentant, reformed, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Jews as long as there's still futurist falsehoods being taught in the Protestant and evangelical churches. That's what we're here to stop. Futurism must be destroyed, lock, stock, and barrel. And we're not going to do it by force. We're going to do it by the truth historical and biblical and prophetic truth that cannot be denied by any intellectually honest person, any spiritually honest person. Futurism is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It is the greatest abomination, and it has destroyed so many Christian lives, and it's time for it to end, high time for it to end. Back to you, Yerk. Jesus is the one that is spoken of in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it reads, 
and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Read Jesus Christ. It, read Jesus Christ, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I just couldn't continue this broadcast home without not correctly citing the Bible, so I just took it out and read it. I think Very these well. things are too important than to just go over it and say, yeah, something like this is written in the Bible. <laughs> Look it up and read it for what it says. I think that's most important. So, continue. When he, said, uh, when he died, he said, it is finished. Sin has now had its death wound given. Like Samson's, let me die with the Philistines. Animamke in vulnere ponit. That is Latin and means he inflicts the wound and dies. Secondly, to make an end of sin, to abolish it, that it may not rise up in judgment against us, to obtain the pardon of it, that it may not be our ruin to seal up sins, so the margin reads it, that they may not appear or break out against us, to accuse and condemn us, as when Christ cast the devil into the bottomless pit, he set a seal upon him, as we can read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. When sin is pardoned, it is sought for and not found, as that which is sealed up, sealed up, huh? seal up the vision and prophecy. Huh? Remember right. that. Use, use, using words right out of Daniel's prophecy. Yeah. If anybody's as intimately familiar with Daniel's prophecy as Yerk and I are, you would instantly recognize the language that we just read as coming directly from Daniel's prophecy. And when Christ said, it is finished, what did he mean? What was finished? Daniel's 70th week. The covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And when he gave up the ghost, he said, it is finished. He was talking about Daniel's prophecy and all the prophecies in the Old Testament that predicted the coming of Messiah and the reconciliation that he would make between God and man. Wonderful stuff. And how you cheat yourself when you believe in a future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. What error, what gross, inexcusable error. Back to you, Yerk. Thirdly, he says, to make reconciliation for iniquity as by a sacrifice to satisfy the justice of God and so to make peace and bring God and man together not only as an arbitrator or referee who only brings the contending parties to a good understanding one of another, but as a surety or undertaker for us. He is not only the peacemaker, he is peace himself. He is the atonement. He came to bring in everlasting righteousness. God might justly have made an end of the sin by making an end of the sinner, but Christ found out another way, and so made an end of sin as to save the sinner from it by providing a righteousness for him. Christ's righteousness, that is. We are all guilty before God. It says, we are all born in trespasses and sin, and we all fall short of the glory of God, right? So we are all guilty before God, and shall be condemned as guilty if we have not a righteousness wherein to appear before him. Had we stood, our innocency would have been our righteousness, but having fallen, we must have something else to plead, and Christ has provided us a plea. He is our advocate with the Father. The merit of his sacrifice is our righteousness. With this we answer all the demands of the law. Christ has died, yea, rather has risen again. Thus Christ is the Lord 
of our righteousness, for he is made of God to us righteousness, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. By faith we apply this to ourselves and plead it with God, and our faith is imputed to us for righteousness, as we can read in Romans chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Quote, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies. What does that do with Roman Catholic works salvation? Yes, what does that do to the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church? The means by which Roman Catholics are saved is by working those seven sacraments. It's a works gospel. It is earning your salvation by good works. The sacraments are the good works by which a Roman Catholic is saved. And they say that performing these sacraments, grace is infused. Okay? And uh, there's very little faith needed in the Roman Catholic Church except the faith to believe that the sacraments will earn your way to heaven. Okay? That is the faith of the Roman Catholic Church, the belief in the sacraments, the belief that the papacy has the power to absolve your sins. It's heresy. It's damnable heresy. It's apostasy. It's hard to call something that is not even derived from Christ, uh, an apostasy, okay? You understand that to call it an apostasy is to call it Christianity in error, okay? That's giving too much credit to the Roman Catholic Church. It's not Christianity. It's popery, okay? It's pope worship. Remember, Satan offered Christ the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them all if he would just bow down and worship Satan. And Jesus wouldn't have it. But Satan offered that same gift to someone else, and he took it. And he rules over the kingdoms of this world, and the glory of them belonged to him. But he is a liar. He is the vicar of Satan himself, and he is the fountain from which all error emits. And uh, futurism is the masterstroke of their deceptive genius. They've gotten every Christian in this world to say with their mouth that Jesus has not come in the flesh, that Jesus was not the Messiah. And the way they say that is the 70th week of Daniel is future. Now, anybody, like I said before, anybody who's familiar with Daniel's prophecy can read in Matthew Henry's commentary that we're reading the very words of Daniel's prophecy. Matthew Henry and all the expositors prior to about 1800 AD, all the expositors of the Bible were historicists in their understanding. They'd never heard of futurism. It's the newest abomination on the block, and it has it has festered uh, and metastasized in every church in this land. And that's why I say over and over, and people just can't wrap their brains around it that the worst place for God's people today is in a church. And just exactly where you would expect Satan to be able to do his most damage is right in the center of the, of the house of God. And that's where he is. He's a genius of, decept of deception. 
He's right behind the pulpit of your church. He's very pretty. His wife is very pretty. They're very eloquent. They've got a lot of money, and uh, they've got a lot of influence. They're very proficient with the English language, and uh, they're everything to love and nothing to hate, but they're lying to you every time they open their mouth. And when they say the 70th week of Daniel is future, there's the worst one of all. When they say the 70th week of Daniel is future, they have denied that Jesus is the Christ. Treachery, that's what the churches are. Spiritual tombs, that's what you go into every time you go into a church. You go into a death chamber. They'll kill you spiritually. They'll get you to condemn yourself with your own mouth and then leave you ignorant as to how you did it. That's a pretty dangerous place to be in, isn't it? That's why I tell people, graciously, please get out of the churches and study the scriptures alone at home with a few friends because that's where God is found. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. But you put them in a great big congregation with a big fancy suited preacher in the, in the pulpit, reading out of a counterfeit Bible, preaching a counterfeit salvation, a works gospel, and a future Messiah, you're dead as dead can be. Back to you, Yerk. Is it just me, Tom? Or can you really see in this face of the devil Kenneth Copeland? That's right. It's a perfect image. I think when you, when you look at that, and then you look at Kenneth Copeland, you can really yeah. see that face in there. Yeah, but we don't, we don't want to put all the blame on Kenneth Copeland. He's just one brick in the satanic wall. Oh. The, the most famous, the most popular, the most well-loved pastors in the history of this country, and I'll name one of them, Billy Graham. They were all futurists. Wolves in sheep's clothing. There's not a lick of difference between Billy Graham and this devil that you're seeing on the screen right now, Kenneth Copeland. They were all futurists. They all preached a future 70th week of Daniel. They all led all of their people astray. They led them all to profess with their mouth that Messiah had not come in the flesh. Who else will tell you this? Who else will tell you that the churches are death traps? It's it's an unavoidable it's an unavoidable truth. Once somebody shows you how they've caused you to condemn yourself with your own mouth. I'll say it with the words of, um, what's this guy's name? El Gore. It's an inconvenient truth, Tom. Yeah, very inconvenient. That's right. But let's continue a little bit in the reading. I want to repeat by faith we apply, because I think it is important that we understand that faith is imputed instead of infused. That's a exactly. very, very important difference between yep. those two. Listen, it, it comes from the very thing that we just read, that Matthew Henry wrote and you read. It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay? That's another way of saying righteousness was imputed to Abraham simply because he believed God. He didn't call God a liar. Okay? Abraham believed God. In other words, he believed by faith. And that's why our faith is accounted unto us for righteousness. 
Our faith in the gospel, the belief that Jesus' blood reconciles us to God, does away with sin, brings in everlasting righteousness, seals up the vision and the prophecy, that is our faith. That is exactly what Abraham had. He believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's what made Abraham righteous, because he believed God. And when we believe that Jesus is the payment for our sin, the propitiation for our sin, that he wipes away our sin, he reconciles us to God, he brings in everlasting righteousness, we have the same righteousness that Abraham had. It's an imputed righteousness. It's an accounting term where you are taken from the debit side to the from the credit side to the debit side of the ledger. You become not a liability but an asset. Okay? It's an accounting term. That's why the Bible says and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's imputation. Okay, in the Roman Catholic Church and all the apostate churches, that's all the churches, people. Let me repeat, it's not just the Roman Catholic Church. They're all uniting with Rome. They're all teaching the same lies. There is no imputed righteousness in those churches. Okay, they are infused. Righteousness is infused by participating in the Mass and the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not about believing God. It's about believing the Pope and the priests and the priesters. It's about believing in a sacrifice other than the sacrifice that Jesus made. You see, the terms that they use expose the fraud that they are. Imputed righteousness is simply when God takes your name from the credit side and puts it on the debit side. That's how you're justified. God has imputed to you righteousness. It's all his act, and he's the bookkeeper, and he can turn you from a, a credit uh, uh, from a credit to a debit. He can turn you from a liability to an asset just by decree. Not so in the Roman Catholic Church and all the other apostate so-called Christian churches in the world. You have to have righteousness infused. Okay? And it's infused by participating in the system of righteousness, works righteousness that has been devised by the devil himself and given to the Pope to impose upon the world. And that's the new world order. That is the new ecumenical religion. It includes every religion. And uh, you're gonna, if you live long enough, you're going to see it come to full fruition. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much for your explanation there, Tom. Still, by faith we apply this to ourselves and plead it with God, and our faith is imputed to us for righteousness. Again, Romans chapter 4, verses 3 and 5. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This is an everlasting righteousness for Christ. Let me just see if I switch my mic on. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure. This is an everlasting righteousness for Christ, who is our righteousness, and the Prince of our peace is the everlasting Father. It was from everlasting in the counsels of it, and will be to everlasting in the consequences of it. The application of it was from the beginning, for Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and it will be to the end, for he is able to save to the uttermost. It is of everlasting virtue, and here comes a quote from the book of Hebrews, and that's why I said this is absolutely a book we are going to study online 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, quote, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It is the rock that follows us to Canaan. He came to seal up the vision and prophecy. All the prophetical visions of the Old Testament which had reference to the Messiah. He sealed them up, that is, he accomplished them. He answered to them to a, li to a, t uh, to a tittle. All things that were written in the law, the prophets and the psalms concerning the Messiah were fulfilled in him. That's why I always say, Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel and every jot and every tittle of it. There is nothing left of the 70th week of Daniel to be fulfilled in the future. There is no hope in the world that anyone other than Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago will fulfill that prophecy. And isn't it strange? And that's a kind word to describe it. Isn't it strange that the whole Christian world thinks the Antichrist will fulfill that prophecy? You can't get more jacked up than that. And that's just how apostate the churches are. They are not fit places for God's people. They are dangerous places for God's people. Get out of the churches before they deceive you irreparably. Back to you, Yerk. Again, he came to seal up the vision and prophecy, all the prophetical visions of the Old Testament, which had reference to the Messiah. He sealed them all up, that is, he accomplished them all. He answered to them to a tittle. All things that were written in the law, all things that were written in the prophets and the Psalms concerning the Messiah were fulfilled in him and in him alone. Once. Thus he confirmed the truth of them as well as his own mission. He sealed them up, that is, he put an end to that method of God's discovering his mind and will and took another course by completing the scripture canon in the New Testament, which is the more sure word of prophecy than that by vision. Second Peter 1.19 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Especially 2 Peter 1.19, we, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What word do we have that is more sure than prophecy? The New we Testament have, fulfillment have, of it. We have Jesus Christ. The Word yep. became flesh and dwelt among us. Yep. That is a more sure word than prophecy alone. We have had Jesus. We have Jesus Christ. That's what he says here. We have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Okay. The day star what they had, is... Oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to step on you No, there. that's okay. I just wanted to say the day star here is concerning yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah? He is, right. he is uh, uh, the bright and morning star in the book of Revelation and he is the day star here in uh, Second Peter. Okay, uh, please, Tom. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you <laughs> neither. So, okay. what they had before was the law and the prophets, what we call the Old Testament. And and one, the law condemned us all, and gave us the need for a Messiah. Okay, what what, what the law does is to condemn every man. 
That's why the Bible says, the New Testament says, you were born dead in trespasses and sins. The law gave us the knowledge of sin, that we are all sinners. And that caused us to have a need for a solution. And the prophets, once the law has condemned us all, then the prophets serve to predict the Messiah who would reconcile us to God, who would make us all righteous. The prophets Those told of us who were condemned by the law were going to be made righteous by the Messiah. That's what the prophets prophesied. Yeah, the prophets prophesied the solution to the problem That's right. of the sin. That's right. But until that solution came, all they had was hope. All they had was uh, uh, an, an inkling of this Messiah that was to come. But when Messiah came, they witnessed him with his own eyes. They handled him with, his, with their own hands. They saw him do miracles. They heard him speak unbelievable truth. They saw and heard him die on the cross. They saw his blood shed, and they heard the rumblings of the, of the earthquake and the, the cracking of the rocks. They heard the, the thunderous roar of the veil in the temple being ripped from top to bottom and falling wide open. They had the fulfillment. That is the more sure word of prophecy. That which the prophets could only prophesy and foretell was now visibly seen. That's the more sure word of prophecy. The more sure word of prophecy is seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled with your own eyes. And they all saw it. They all testified to it. And now they had perfect understanding what the prophets, what the prophets were all saying. And they had, with their perfect understanding, a complete reconciliation with God. And the law could condemn them no more. What a glorious day. And to say that any of that is to happen in the future is a damnable lie. It is rejection that Jesus is the Messiah. And we're all still yet in our sins. To say the 70th week of Daniel is to deny, his future is to deny our own salvation in Christ Jesus. I can't impress upon you enough what a horror futurism is. And again, for those who are not paying attention, futurism is simply the belief that the 70th week of Daniel is not yet fulfilled and won't be fulfilled until the future. It is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, and it has the greatest of consequences. I hope you can understand me. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, both, both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action.
DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this House. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this. If the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in his truth. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.